Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is December the 29th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is One a Day for the Soul. Now, we're continuing our study through the book of Romans, and today we're going to find that Paul shifts his train of thoughts from the believer in the Lord Jesus, from the follower unto the people of Israel to the Jew that has rejected their Messiah. And Paul's heart is breaking because of this fact. Yet Paul is going to relinquish his own will that all Israel would be saved, and he's going to solely rely upon the providence of God, that God has predestinated man, that God has chosen whom he will show mercy to and whom he will harden. Now, understandably so, because of our upbringings and the things that we've been taught in the Christian church, this is a difficult chapter for us to read because we want to believe that we have some control in our lives. But if you look at chapter 9, and specifically verse 18, it says, Therefore hath he mercy? Has not God mercy on him whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth? Now, in trying to get your mind around this, Paul understands and answers in verse 19 and says, well, then you will say unto me, why does he find fault? For if he wills some to be damned and some to be saved, who has resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who are you that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Does not the potter, God Almighty, have power over the clay, and of one lump to make one unto honor, and another lump to make one unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath that have been fitted to destruction? Now, friends, the speech here. The words here are very clear in what they're trying to communicate. But again, I understand that these are very difficult for us to hear because in our estimation, we think it unfair for God to choose some and for God to reject others. And so in order for us to understand what this passage is saying, we must approach it with no bias, no tradition. We must not hold on to anything that we've heard before. We must approach it with fresh eyes, fresh perspective, allowing it to speak to us its truth and letting go of our former beliefs and allowing the word of God to speak for itself. And as comfortable as the idea of free will may be, understanding that God has predestinated all things according to his plan and his will. And that's what Paul is doing here. Paul is saying, look, I desire that all Israel be saved. And as a nation, they will be. But there are many individually as Jews that reject the Messiah and will be forever lost and punished for doing so. And though yet it is my will that each of these, each and every one of them will be saved, I must let go and allow God's plan to work itself out and I must be very careful not to question God along the way. So what I want to do for the remainder of our time together is I want you to pause this video for a moment. I want you to go to the link that I've provided both on screen right now and in the description box. I want you to get your favorite beverage, a cup of coffee, a glass of water, maybe a soft drink. I want you to place yourself in a very relaxed position and last, I want you to read chapter 9 from your Bible. Once you have done that, I want you to come back to this video, and we're going to read together chapter 9 from the Message Bible. And it's important that you read it from your Bible first so that you can allow the Word of God to speak to you from familiar words that you're used to from having read this many times before, possibly, 
And as we read from the Message Bible, you may see this chapter with a fresh perspective. So go ahead, do the things that I've asked of you, pause the video, and when you come back, we'll begin Romans chapter 9, and we'll be reading from the Message Bible. Okay, let's begin at Romans chapter 9, verse 1. At the same time, you need to know that I carry with me at all times a huge sorrow. It's an enormous pain deep within me, and I'm never free of it. I'm not exaggerating. Christ and the Holy Spirit are my witnesses. It's the Israelites. If there were any way that I could be cursed by the Messiah so that they could be blessed by him, I would do it in a minute. They are my family. I grew up with them. They had everything going for them. Family, glory, covenants, revelation, worship, promises, to say nothing of being the race that produced the Messiah, the Christ, who is God over everything, always, oh yes. Don't suppose for a moment, though, that God's word has malfunctioned in some way or other. The problem goes back a long way. From the outset, not all Israelites of the flesh were Israelites of the Spirit. It wasn't Abraham's sperm that gave identity here, but it was God's promise. Remember how it was put? Your family will be defined by Isaac. That means that Israelite identity was never racially determined by sexual transmission, but it was God determined by promise. Do you remember the promise when it said, when I come back next year at this time, Sarah will have a son? And that's not the only time to Rebecca. Also, a promise was made that took priority over genetics. When she became pregnant by our one-of-a-kind ancestor, Isaac, and her babies were still innocent in the womb, they were incapable of good or bad, she received a special assurance from God. What God did in this case made it perfectly plain that his purpose is not a hit or miss thing, dependent on what we do or what we don't do. But it is a sure thing, determined by his decision, flowing steadily from his initiative. God told Rebecca, the firstborn of your twins will take second place. Later, that was turned into a stark epigram. When God said, I loved Jacob, I hated Esau. Is that grounds for complaining that God is unfair? Not so fast, please. God told Moses, I'm in charge of mercy. I'm in charge of compassion. Compassion doesn't originate in our bleeding hearts or our moral sweat, but it originates in God's mercy. The same point was made when God said to Pharaoh, I picked you as a bit player in this drama of my salvation power. All we're saying here, friends, is that God has the first word, initiating the action in which we play our part for good or for ill. Now, are you going to object by saying, so how can God blame us for anything since he's in charge of everything? And if the big decisions are already made, what say do we have in it? Who in the world do you think you are to second-guess God? Do you for one moment suppose any of us knows enough to call God into question? Clay doesn't talk back to the fingers that mold it, saying, why did you shake me like this? Isn't it obvious that a potter has a perfect right to shape one lump of clay into a vase for holding flowers? and another into a pot for cooking beans? If God needs one style of pottery especially designed to show his angry displeasure, and another style carefully crafted to show his glorious goodness, isn't that all right? Either or both happens to Jews, but it also happens to the other people. Hosea put it well when he said, I will call nobodies, and make them somebodies. I'll call the unloved, and I will make them beloved. In the place where they yelled out, you're nobody, 
They're calling you God's living children. Isaiah maintained this same emphasis when he said, if each grain of sand on the seashore were numbered and the sum was labeled chosen of God, they would be numbers still, not names. Salvation comes by personal selection. God doesn't count us. He calls us by name. Arithmetic is not his focus. Isaiah also looked ahead and spoke the truth when he said, if our powerful God had not provided us a legacy of living children, we would have ended up like ghost towns, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, how can we, as the people of God, sum this all up? All those people who didn't seem interested in what God was doing actually embraced what God was doing as he straightened out their lives. And Israel, who seemed so interested in reading and talking about what God was doing, they missed it. And how could they miss it? Because of instead of trusting God, they took over. They were absorbed in what they themselves were doing. They were so absorbed in their God projects that they didn't notice God right in front of them, like a huge rock in the middle of the road. And so they stumbled into him and went sprawling. Isaiah again gives us the perfect metaphor for pulling this together when he says, careful, I've put a huge stone on the road to Mount Zion, a stone that you cannot get around. But the stone is me. If you're looking for me, you'll find me on the way to Mount Zion, not in the way. And that brings us to an end of chapter 9. Now, it is not my intentions to add anything to the Word of God today. I simply want you to allow the Word of God to speak to you. So if you need to, go back and read chapter 9 again from your Bible, from your chosen version. And then you may want to read it again from the link that I've given you, which would be the translation from the Message Bible. And allow the Word of God to speak deeply to you. And then you will better understand the words of Jesus when he said, when you pray, pray not my will be done, but thine be done, O God. For each and every one of us, no matter how unimportant we think we are, we fit into this great plan of God where he is ultimately working his plan and his will. And so we must resign ourselves to the fact that everything we pray for, the answer is not going to always be yes. That's even the salvation of others. Because just as much as predestination and God choosing whom will be saved and whom will be rejected is absolutely true, so too, friends, is free will. It is absolutely true. And this is where we as humans fail because we have so much difficulty in comprehending that both can be right, that we are saved solely by faith, but without works will never enter the kingdom, that we are eternally secure in our salvation. But if we do not continue in obedience, we can fall from grace. And that even though God has predetermined all things, we still exercise free will in the choices that we make. And our minds only want to stand on one side or the other of these issues. But who's to say in God's great wisdom that both are not true? And so keep that in mind when you read and study this chapter, because the word of God is very clear on what is being said here. And our responsibility as his followers is to simply read, heed, and obey what it is that we are learning. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful that you're again with us. I pray that you'll allow the word of God to find its place within you. And as difficult as it may be, you'll let go of everything that you have preconceived, that you have pre-understood, And as uncomfortable as this may be, you'll stand upon the word of God and the word of God alone. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.